Tonight, the state government's budget scheme to tackle the housing crisis. Also, the driver charged over the death of Charlie Stevens pleads guilty to lesser offences. The latest ceasefire proposal for the war in Gaza looking uncertain. And the Matildas warm up for the Olympics with a strong win over China. Good evening, Jessica Harmson with ABC News South Australia. First home buyers who buy or build new homes won't have to pay stamp duty from Thursday under an expansion of the state government's existing scheme. It's part of a pre-budget housing push, with the government also announcing just under 2,000 new dwellings will be built across Adelaide's west and south. But there's some angst from public housing tenants who've been told they'll have to move out of their homes to make way. Stephanie Richards reports. The face of development in Adelaide's west. Well, a lot of the people around here, like us, who don't want to move out of this area. For almost 20 years, Alan Dixon and his wife have called Seaton home. On Monday, they received a letter telling them they'll be moved out of their housing trust property. I don't feel too good about it. Very much so. And neither does my wife. About 340 Seaton households will be shifted from their publicly owned homes to make way for about 1,300 new dwellings. We'll be going stage by stage, uh, basically block by block, um, working with tenants, getting them into uh, more appropriate accommodation. The government says while more than 380 housing trust properties will go, the same number will be replaced in the new build. The development will cost taxpayers $425 million. An additional $150 million will be spent developing vacant land at Norlunga. That collectively will result in, in 1,900 900 new homes, a significant parcel of which will be for public housing and another parcel of which will be for affordable homes on the private market. It comes as the state government tries to address ongoing housing problems in this week's budget. Stamp duty will be abolished for first home buyers purchasing or building a new home. Last year's cap on relief scrapped, meaning all first home buyers will be eligible. This is one of the biggest shake-ups and tax reductions that we've seen when it comes to the cost of building and land in our state in its history. The opposition says the government should offer a package to help people purchase existing properties too. We believe that uh, providing relief, we suggested $10,000, that will remain the policy we now take to the next election. The government says that move would just add to prices. Stephanie Richards, ABC News. There are renewed calls for the government to scrap ambulance fees for pensioners days out from the state budget. The service is free for cardholders in most states and territories, but advocates say it's time for SA to catch up. Imogen Hain has more. You have to work out, you know, do I have to pay it? How do I pay it? Where do yeah. I get the money from? Mm -hmm. When Dio Lachlan started getting sick with pneumonia last year, she was hesitant to call an ambulance. I had a temperature of over 40 and I was a little bit in and out of being aware. And I had thought, I need to go to the hospital, but the kids are all interstate overseas. I'll, I could get a taxi. When bills for about $1,400 rolled in soon after, her worries were confirmed. She says the cost is driving older South Australians without ambulance cover to put their health second. Is it a real emergency or will I get better? Will I just take some more Panadol and go back to bed and hope? In Queensland and Tasmania, call-outs are free for all residents and most other parts of the country cover ambulance fees for pension concession card holders. So even though it would cost the budget bottom line for SA to follow suit, advocates believe it would save millions in the long run. There's a lot of data that shows that there is no impact on usage by making ambulance free. And the wonderful thing is we've got other states of Australia to show us that that is the case. And this is a government that is putting billions of dollars into road projects. It could put the money into this, particularly in the middle of an economic crisis and in the middle of a health crisis. The Treasurer Stephen Mulligan says SA's ambulance service offers memberships with discounted fees for pensioners. They're $58 for singles and $115 for families. Pensioners may also be eligible to apply for a concession after they get their bill. 
And there are things I can do, and, but they're not that easy. And when you're not feeling that brilliant, things go. A pressure Dio Lachlan hopes will be eased in Thursday's budget. Imogen Hain, ABC News. A young driver accused of causing the death of the police commissioner's son during schoolies celebrations last year has had a charge of causing death by dangerous driving dropped. Deren Randhawa today pleaded guilty to two lesser charges in relation to the death of Charlie Stevens. And outside court, Commissioner Grant Stevens said the young driver had provided a letter of apology to his family. Facing extra scrutiny in the high-profile case. Diran Randhawa today pleading guilty to aggravated driving without due care and leaving the scene of an accident at Goolwa Beach in November last year. The 19-year-old was accused of causing the fatal crash that killed Charlie Stevens, son of SA Police Commissioner Grant Stevens. 18-year-old Charlie suffered an irreversible brain injury and died a day later in hospital. His father choosing to speak after the hearing. I think on behalf of uh, our family, we'd just like to acknowledge that Diran has taken responsibility for his actions that saw us lose our son Charlie. And uh, we've also been handed a, a letter of apology, so we'll take time to read that. The prosecution told the court the more serious charge of caused death by dangerous driving is withdrawn, along with the charge of failing to truly answer questions by police. Rand Hauer appeared nervous as he stood in the dock. He spoke softly as he entered his guilty pleas to the magistrate's court. He'll appear in the state's district court in August with his bail continued. Evelyn Leckie, ABC News, Adelaide. The federal government has come up with a new plan of attack to better attract and retain people in the armed forces. From next month, Defence will begin looking to recruit permanent residents from across the Tasman and later other close allies. To address a 4,000 person shortfall in Defence, the government is looking to foreign nationals, permanent residents willing to serve in exchange for a fast track to citizenship in a recruitment policy march into uncharted territory. It's a significant crossing of the Rubicon today. But the government was forced to double back after confusion over exactly who will make up the 350 extra people forecast to join per year as a result. It'll apply to other Five Eyes countries and permanent residents from any other countries. The prospect of recruits from any other country forced a clean-up in question time. In the future, we are having an eye to the Pacific. It's a dog's breakfast. The policy's now been clarified. From July, New Zealanders who are permanent residents in Australia and have lived here for more than a year will be able to apply to join the Defence Force. From January, that eligibility will be broadened to include permanent residents from Canada, the United States and United Kingdom, assuming all security checks are met. The opposition labelling the move half-baked. If you value and respect, truly value and respect, the effort of the Australian men and women who wear our uniform, you don't start to cheapen the entry price to get into the Australian Defence Force. You are going to have to come up and offer them better pay and better conditions. The mother of a Navy officer who took his own life says deeper cultural change is needed. People from overseas that, or, you know, from other countries that might want to enlist here just need to look at our track record. There's a reason why new recruitment ideas are being embraced. Defence isn't only lagging on the people it needs now, it's also well behind its goal of a permanent 80,000 strong force by 2040. Nicole Hegarty, ABC News, Canberra. Immigration Minister Andrew Giles has revealed he's considering cancelling the visa of a Melbourne gangland figure who the Administrative Appeals Tribunal has allowed to stay in the country. Yesterday, the tribunal cited a direction from the Immigration Minister in 2023 demanding it consider a foreign national's strength and length of ties to the community. It reinstated the visa of an associate of the Mockbell crime family, 51-year-old convicted criminal Kevin Ferugia. The direction is soon to be replaced after revelations it's led to a number of convicted criminals being permitted to stay in Australia. I have over the last week cancelled 35 visas and there are more under review. I am aware of the case that uh, 
uh, the shadow minister refers to, which was decided by the AAT yesterday, and it is under consideration in accordance with the national interest. The US says Israel stands ready to push ahead with a plan that could lead to a total ceasefire in Gaza. That's despite far-right Israeli ministers threatening to topple the government if a truce is sealed. Pressure for a breakthrough is growing as details emerge of four hostages possibly killed by Israeli forces. No sign of peace. Just one of more than 50 targets Israel says it struck in the past 24 hours. With Gazan cities and tent camps demolished, desperate Palestinians are pleading for a ceasefire. Hamas, accept the deal. It's enough. But far-right members of Benjamin Netanyahu's coalition have threatened to bring down the Israeli government should the deal outlined by US President Joe Biden go ahead. This is a draft of a reckless deal, and now there is some sort of an attempt to whitewash it. The Prime Minister is insisting the ceasefire conditions have not changed, but he has doubled down on crushing Hamas. We have gone a long way to return the hostages, while keeping the war's objectives in mind, primarily the elimination of Hamas. It appears the Israeli Prime Minister's private commitments to the US are now being forced into the public eye by the White House, which wants an end to this war. It's left Benjamin Netanyahu having to placate his right-wing ministers, now suggesting a temporary truce could start, while negotiations continue for a permanent ceasefire, leaving open the possibility the war could also continue. Despite the conflicting statements from Israel, Joe Biden has told Qatari mediators that Israel stands ready to move forward with the deal. The only thing standing in the way of an immediate ceasefire today is Hamas. The Israeli army has revealed four more of the hostages kidnapped by Hamas are now confirmed dead. The army believes the four were killed while Israel was operating in Khan Yunus, possibly by IDF fire. If we're not going to negotiate and we'll make a hostage deal, there's no hope for this country. Every day without a breakthrough, only adding to suffering and heartache. Alison Horn, ABC News, Jerusalem. 640 million votes are being tallied in India tonight in the largest democratic count in history. Prime Minister Narendra Modi is ahead, but the opposition is doing better than expected. Our correspondent, Meghna Bali, explains why. Look, the atmosphere is quite subdued here in New Delhi. I'm standing outside Parliament House and the results aren't going quite as expected. Now, the BJP and their allies and Narendra Modi, the PM, do have a clear majority in 300 seats, but the opposition has put up a real fight. Now, exit polls show that Mr Modi would win this election quite comfortably, but results today have really shown that Congress Party, along with their opposition allies, have put up a real fight. There's an atmosphere of jubilation at Congress headquarters at the moment, not quite as uh, celebratory at BJP headquarters. They've been quite humbled. And that's because they haven't made quite the gains that they thought they were going to make in a state called Uttar Pradesh, which is the largest and most politically significant. They spent a lot of their campaign uh, flexing their economic ch achievements and their commitment to Hindu revivalism. But that sort of message just didn't work with them. This is a, a, a group of people, citizens, that were really hurting with cost of living pressures and rising unemployment. So that message hasn't really come through in the same ways that it did in 2019. Just days after Donald Trump's historic conviction, President Joe Biden's son is now on trial. Hunter Biden pleaded not guilty to allegations he lied when buying a gun in 2018. North America correspondent Barbara Miller was in the court in Delaware. A first lady and a mum. Jill Biden arrives at court to support her stepson. Hunter Biden faces three charges stemming from the purchase of a gun in 2018. It's alleged he lied when he told the licensed dealer he wasn't addicted to drugs. The defendant's troubled past is no secret. Smoking crack and drinking vodka exclusively. 
But now details of his crack cocaine use and turbulent personal life, including a love affair with his dead brother's widow, will be aired in court. Wilmington is the Biden's hometown, and potential jurors were asked if they could be impartial before being sworn in. In a rare statement on the case, Joe Biden said, As the president, I don't and won't comment on pending federal cases. But as a dad, I have boundless love for my son, confidence in him and respect for his strength. A personal drama is playing out in the political spotlight. Hunter Biden is not charged with election interference. He's not running for office. But the timing of this case so soon after Donald Trump's conviction couldn't be worse for his father's re-election campaign. Last week, Joe Biden marked the anniversary of his son Bo's death, a reminder of the personal tragedies the family has endured. If convicted on all charges, the president's surviving son faces up to 25 years in jail. There's much more at stake here for Joe Biden than just a presidential election. Barbara Miller, ABC News, Wilmington, Delaware. The Northern Territory government has revealed how it intends to roll out alcohol management plans across the territory, but some Indigenous leaders fear it will open the floodgates to further addiction. It's been 15 months since alcohol-fuelled crime reached crisis levels in Central Australia. The NT government, under pressure from the Commonwealth, reinstated liquor bans in all communities and town camps six months after intervention-era laws were allowed to lapse. These are complex problems and they require a full solution. And now, more than a year on, the government has revealed its roadmap for rolling out alcohol management plans across the Territory, giving communities which have been dry for up to 50 years the chance to legally access takeaway alcohol. We've got to get away from this paternalistic view of alcohol and saying to communities you just cannot have it. The anti-government has put out a tender for private consultants to help communities develop their management plans. More than 100 remote communities and homelands have registered interest, with about 30 moving to the development stage. We need people to learn to live with alcohol. Beswick is one of the NT's eight remote communities already operating a social club. Leaders say it's helped residents learn to drink responsibly and stopped them from taking risky trips to major centres to buy alcohol. It was mainly the deaths. Um, you know, people just come, started coming back in, in a casket. But other Indigenous leaders fear communities aren't ready for the rivers of grog to return. Putting remote uh, alcohol places on remote communities is adding more fuel to the fire. It's an addiction and it's a feel good because the person's been kicked in the guts all his life and the only way out of it is alcohol. Mixed feelings on a hot topic in the Territory's debates. Charmaine Allison, ABC News, Alice Springs. To finance now, and the Australian dollar moved a little higher today ahead of tomorrow's March quarter GDP release. Here's Alan Kohler. The consensus forecast for economic growth in the March quarter due out tomorrow is 1.2% for the year, 0.2% for the quarter. Not that economists who have to make these forecasts agree on a consensus, of course. Someone just averages all the ways in which they disagree. ANZ and NAB both think in the quarter growth will be zero and 1% for the year, so they reckon it'll be an almost recession. In any case, GDP growth will be less than half population growth, extending Australia's long per-person recession into a second year. The Aussie dollar snuck up a few points to 66.7 US cents, but only because the US dollar fell. The share market fell 0.4% because resources stocks were sold off after iron ore and oil prices fell by quite a lot last night. Global markets didn't do much. Small moves in New York last night and Asia today, except Mexico, where the main share index fell more than 6% after the landslide victory of the country's first female president, Claudia Scheinbaum. Apparently, investors and business people are worried that her party, Moderna, will spend more money and take more control of the economy. Now, in other Mexican news, the Aussie fast food chain Guzmini Gomez has decided to float on the ASX. The number of their restaurants has been growing at 15% a year, compound, and they're expanding into Singapore, Japan and the US. The float will be a spicy $2.2 billion. Finally, the ABS released data on spending on exploration today. 
Exploration for minerals fell 2%, but for oil and gas, it increased 10% in the quarter and 48% over 12 months. I'm just surprised anyone's still looking for fossil fuels at all these days. And that's finance. The Matildas have had a strong win over China in front of a massive crowd in Sydney, their last game at home before the Paris Olympics. The two-goal victory saw the almost 77,000 supporters at Stadium Australia erupt. The match was a bittersweet occasion with an emotional farewell to keeper Lydia Williams. The friendly gave coach Tony Gustafsson his final look at the side before announcing his 18-player squad for Paris. A record crowd of almost 77,000 people turned up to the Olympic Stadium to farewell Australia's favourite team and a treasured veteran. Just listen to this ovation. Lydia Williams was playing her 105th and likely last game for the Matildas. Tennis legend Yvonne Gulagong Corley presented the Noongar keeper with a booker a cloak made from kangaroo skins. Thank you, everyone. Australia and China played out a nil-all first half before captain Steph Catley delivered a pinpoint free kick. It's a great ball, it's a great header. And it's Claire Wheeler. One nil became two nil when Hayley Rasso finished a beautifully weighted through ball from Courtney Vine. And this morning, it became official for Tony Gustafsson's squad of 18. It's been an emotional uh, week, of course, but right now, today, I feel very excited. The Olympics is a really, really difficult tournament. It's quick turnarounds, you know, straight off the bat in the groups, you're playing against, you know, some of the top teams in the world. Steph Catley will captain an experienced squad. She's one of eight Matildas going to their third Olympic Games. Six will be going to their second, while last night's goal scorer, Claire Wheeler, is one of four players who'll be making their Olympic debut. This is a team Australia will be hoping can break the Matildas' duck at major tournaments. After finishing fourth at the World Cup and the last Olympic Games, they now have a great opportunity to finish on the podium. We know we're not the top-ranked teams. We're ranked nine out of 12 teams in this tournament if you look at world ranking. We have a lot of injury issues, as, as you know, as of late. The obvious submission is Sam Kerr. While Katrina Gorey has been selected, she hasn't played since March due to a syndesmosis injury. It's all smiles now, then hard work before the first game against Germany in Marseille. David Mark, ABC News, Sydney. Alex Dimonor has upset world number five Daniil Medvedev to become the first Australian male since Leighton Hewitt in 2004 to reach the quarterfinals of the French Open. Dimonor says the vocal young fan has become his lucky charm and will be courtside again when he takes on German Alexander Zverev. It's the feel-good story of Roland Garros. An enthusiastic supporter of Alex Dimonor in his previous match, French fan Paul was back, riding every point like his life depended on it. <laughs> to show his gratitude. He's managed a miracle. Might have to get him on tour uh, week in and week out. I could hear him after uh, every single point and it's a distinctive voice. Honestly, it was amazing. And now I really hope you'll win. It was incredible. On the clay, I needed hot, lively conditions. But, you know, this week, uh, this whole tournament has proven otherwise. The Demon is likely to be a crowd favourite when he faces fourth seed Alexander Zverev. The German is coming off two gruelling five-set wins. I've played a total of eight and a half hours over the last three days, so um, I need to recover. Charmed by his side, a maiden Grand Slam semi-final is in his sights. Duncan Hunstale, ABC News. 19-year-old midfielder Billy Dowling will make his AFL debut in Thursday night's Adelaide Oval clash with Richmond. The North Adelaide Junior has been dominating in the local league with calls to play him in the AFL as the Crows' finals hopes slip away. The fallout from Saturday's loss to Hawthorne has already claimed Matt Crouch to season-ending shoulder surgery, while captain Jordan Dawson and forward Taylor Walker are also battling to be fit. Veteran Rory Laird says critics of the club's poor first half of the season need to be patient with the team's younger players. 
I think it's it's um, a learning curve for these young players. You forget how young some of these guys are and how many sort of games they've played. They've played, you know, 30, 40 games. It's all new to them. Dustin Martin's 300th game celebrations have been put on ice with the Richmond veteran ruled out of Thursday night's match against Adelaide. Illness means he'll need to wait another week to become just the seventh Tiger to reach the milestone. Sitting on 299 games, Dustin Martin was a notable absence from Tigers training. He's actually ill today, so, um, so that's taken that out of our hands. With three premierships, three Norm Smith medals, four All-Australians and one Brownlow under the belt, Dusty looks set to add 300 games to his resume in Adelaide against the Crows. But the five-day break proved tricky for the injury-hit Tigers. And the silver lining to that is the fact that he'll get to play his 300th in front of our crowd um, against the Hawks next week. In some good news on the injury front, Trio Shea Bolton, Tim Taranto and Dion Prestia are available and others are nearing a return. Tom and, and Jacob Hopper are getting closer. Um, they're in almost full training, um, so just going to make a decision on whether they play before the buy or after that. Max King will need to pass a fitness test on Thursday to make himself eligible for Saints selection this week. The 23-year-old hoping to be available ahead of their clash against the Suns. I think he's still a little bit, a little bit ginger, but no structural damage or anything like that. So I think, um, yeah, we'll just see how he, how he pulls up as the days go on. In Brisbane, Hugh McCluggage will remain a lion with the co-vice captain now locked in through 2031, the 26-year-old resisting big offers from rival clubs. It's been a great ride and um, I still think that there's plenty of good times left. The Harbour City's two sides have made similar moves in locking up talent. Will Hayward signing a five-year extension with the ladder-leading Swans and Sam Taylor tying his long-term future to the Giants until the end of 2032. It's almost as though if you're not offering a long-term contract for, for key players such as Sam, then you, you're probably not securing their, their signatures. Fraser Fife, ABC News. South Africa has started its men's T20 World Cup tournament with a six-wicket win over Sri Lanka in Nassau County on Long Island. Sri Lanka was dismissed for only 77, its lowest total in a T20 international. The Proteas reached the victory target with more than three overs to spare. In Guyana, Afghanistan thrashed World Cup debutant Uganda by 125 runs. Time to check the weather details now and tonight's photo was sent to us by Keith Miller and was taken at Warina Cove. After a wet start to the day, it was mostly cool and dry in Adelaide today. It reached 15.1 degrees in the city about 3 o'clock this afternoon after a low of 9.8. Further afield, a trough over central and northeastern parts continued to generate showers after frost patches brought another chilly morning to the southeast. It reached just 11 degrees in Woomera. A cloud band with moist winds and a developing low will continue to generate patchy rain over western Queensland, New South Wales, Victoria and our state, while moist northwesterly winds should also bring the odd shower or two to southwestern WA. Elsewhere, a high will keep the remainder mostly clear and dry. So mostly sunny with 29 degrees for Cairns and Townsville tomorrow. Showers for Sydney and Canberra, but it'll be fine sunny in 23 in Perth. Back home, showers in the north will clear for a dry and partly cloudy day tomorrow. 19 degrees for Ceduna and 17 in Port Augusta. Further south, low temperatures overnight will bring possible frost and fog to the southeast, with tops ranging from 19 in Kingscote to 15 in Clare. There's a frost warning for the mid north and upper and lower southeast. Another mild and partly cloudy day for Adelaide tomorrow. We're heading for 18 degrees in the city after an overnight low of just six. On the waters, southwesterly winds to 10 knots, tending southeasterly in the evening and seas below a metre. Sunrise around a quarter past seven, with sunset around 10 past five. And looking further ahead, remaining dry and partly cloudy on Thursday and Friday before showers forecast for the rest of the week. 17 degrees over the weekend and 19 degrees Monday and this time next week. And that's the latest from the Adelaide Newsroom. Thanks very much for your company this evening. Stay with us. Sarah Ferguson's next with 7.30.